Good evening and welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of our forum with Afshin John Rodson. Many of you know our original speaker tonight, Sam Harris, chose to cancel his uh, appearance here at the Town Hall Forum just about 10 days ago. It was a surprise to us. He told us that he had received so many uh, threats against his life that he was concerned about appearing here in the Twin Cities. Uh, as you know, he's a, a well-known author uh, as an atheist, has skewered every religion, uh, including the one I adhere to, and, and uh, uh, it was going to be interesting to have him in our pulpit. Uh, but he was going to speak on spirituality and religion, and uh, actually his new book is a guide to being spiritual without being religious, something like that. So I was going to ask him if he actually finally got religion, but uh, I don't have the chance to do that because of his sense that he was uh, under threat and didn't want to uh, uh, appear. And it was his decision. We don't, we don't have any basis for uh, understanding whether those threats are real or not. In fact, we'll discuss them maybe tonight. But our first inclination, frankly, was to just kind of close down the forum and not have a forum tonight. And then we said to ourselves, no, this is probably a topic that we need to talk about. This is the kind of, the kind of thing that the forum exists to do, to have public conversation on issues that matter. And this certainly is an issue that matters, religious extremism in our midst, in our city, uh, and so we decided instead to uh, turn to a local expert who could engage in conversation with us on that topic, and we're very honored that Afshin John Rodson could join us this evening, especially on such short notice. I'm also grateful to Susan McKenna, who is the director of the forum, Susan over here, who managed to turn all this around so quickly. Let's thank Susan for all she does for the forum. Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 34 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis and moderator of the forum. In the last several weeks, national attention has focused on Minnesota as a center for religious extremism. Tonight, Afshin John Rodson, who is a professor at William Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul and a leading authority on national security issues, will explore the topic of religious extremism and terrorism. How should we respond? He brings a unique combination of professional experience in both law enforcement and intelligence activities to this issue. He has served as a federal prosecutor and as assistant general counsel at the CIA. And over the years, he has advised officials from countries around the world on legal issues related to national security. At William Mitchell, he is founder and director of the National Security Forum, an organization committed to increasing public awareness and influencing public policy on the balance between liberty and security in American counterterrorism policies. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Afshin John Rodson. At this moment, I may be the only one in this great setting that is happy that you lost your other speaker. <laughs> I hope that by the end of the presentation, there will be some people that will say that was not so bad. And I have brought two family members, and at the end, they're going to put their hands up and say, I'm happy that that speaker canceled too. <laughs> there is something divine about the number three. There are three great religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Christianity, we speak about three manifestations of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to carry out this tradition of threes to give you three options during this presentation. The first option, it has to do with what you do with your eyes. 
I'm 51, so I need reading glasses. So there's a barrier between me and you all. But those of you that would like to close your eyes for the entire presentation, you're welcome to do so. Close them now, but please don't snore. A second group, if you like, you can attempt to keep your eyes open the entire presentation. This will be tiring by the end, but you can continue to stare at me for 53 minutes. Or, most of you, I invite you at various segments to visualize a visual image that makes sense, and you'll count these visuals, and you'll notice that somehow they divide by three. Now, the first place that I'd like to take you to is London, July 7, 2005. Now, we had the fortune of doing an event with Minnesota Public Radio in London, and we discussed the significance of this day. Now, this is a day after 9-11 where there was a terrorist attack in London. If you recall, there were four suicide bombers. They were killed, and there were 52 other people that were killed, civilians, innocents, in the tube, in the bus. And it's a sad day, and we've had other sad days in the fight against terrorism. So I don't want you to focus on that negative, but I want you to think about the next day. And my ideas are about what we do after the next attack. And the British, they have had more experience than we have in war and in terrorism. And what you will see in London, if you go back, and this is the visual, is to think of Piccadilly Circus, an iconic location, and people went about their business as usual. They took the tube, they took the bus, and implicit in that is that we will not allow threats from whatever sources to change our way of life. We will be free, we will be reasonable, but we will go about our business. Now, you're probably used to hearing the word first responders when we have an attack. We read the 9-11 report about the success and lack of success from fire departments, police departments, the military, we hear about the hospitals. This is all the physical necessities to protect buildings, to seal off areas. And I think we've gotten very good in terms of physical preparedness. Now, you recall it was not a terrorist incident that we had here in the Twin Cities, but we had a bridge that went down. The public sector, the private sector, they work very well. We rebuilt the bridge. So I'm not talking to you today about physical preparedness. But I want you to have something else in mind, and that is a kind of emotional preparedness. To, to say to yourself, we're going to have another attack. It's going to happen. President Bush said it. President Obama said it. They don't get into the details of it because it's bad politics. But I think we would be better as a nation if we accepted this. Tonight, we're going to have an attack and ask ourselves, how will we behave the next day? And then the normative question, how should we behave after the next attack? And that's the core of what I'm asking you today. And I have some ideas about what we should do in terms of the next attack. Now, you're very kind to have me here. Tim mentioned my CIA and Justice Department experience. And you're probably ready to hear these hard recommendations. And there's going to be a lot of softness in what I'm saying. And your second visual, if you choose to close your eyes, is to focus on the Statue of Liberty this great symbol of openness to all people of all faiths, or whether they have faith or not, and we're going to get together at that location after this attack. And we're going to be holding hands. We'll have yoga pants on. We're going to be flexible. We're going to be open-minded. We're not going to turn on each other. We're not going to identify people from particular groups, but we're going to say that this group of individuals did something wrong how can we learn from it? How can we reduce the chances of another attack? Now, the speaker that canceled probably identified a particular threat that exists here in the Twin Cities. And we've been getting coverage in the New York Times. And if something makes it to the New York Times, it's been validated in the country and around the world. So let's, let's talk about this community. And I remember when I showed up here in 2004, I went to meet a former governor, and I wanted to tell him about the events that we were going to do in this location, hopefully in other locations. And he told me, what are you doing? Peddling fear? And the next thing I knew it, I was being escorted out of the office. And I realized maybe, maybe it's because I don't root for Minnesota. He could tell I was a Duke fan. But there was something deeper <laughs> going on in this, this discussion, is that he didn't want to talk about 
what was going on right here in the Twin Cities that I knew about from my friends in law enforcement and the intelligence community. I'll just go through some observations. You'll nod and say, we've heard this before, but let's put it together. And we know that we have the largest Somali community in the United States. Now, the estimates of that community are about 100,000 in the United States and 30 to 40,000 right here. But the New York Times will say repeatedly, we have the largest Somali community here. And they came like my parents seeking a better life. They came fleeing problems in their home country, and they had a refuge here. Now, how did they end up here? I've asked them, how did you all end up here? I tend to have this conversation when it's 20 below zero with them. <laughs> and we're, we're asking ourselves, yes, one winner, but why would anyone come back? And they say that there was a church group and social services, and the first group that came here after the problems in their country, they were well received. They got jobs. And as happens with many immigrant groups, then word spread back home. And some, when someone decided to come to the United States, they didn't do the sensible thing and say, let's go out to San Diego where the weather is nice all year round. They said, you have a cousin. You have a brother. You have a grandfather that lives in the Twin Cities. Why don't you go to the Twin Cities? And that explains here, and they've spread to other parts of the country, why we have such a large Somali community. Now, there is a concern about radicalization. And Somalis are not the only group that's susceptible to radicalization. Radicalization is something that happens to all people of faith or not faith. But what we can see, and maybe we'll dis discuss this in the back and forth, is kind of a conveyor belt going down the line of people willing to do certain services and then going all the way at the end of the conveyor belt where they're willing to kill other people or to kill themselves while killing other people. When we had CIA officers recruiting spies, it's a similar conveyor belt. You get people to do something for you. Then you ask them to do more. You ask them to do more. And you work on any type of weakness that you see. Economic problems, resentment about what's going on here, idealism about what's going on in their home country. You use those human emotions to move toward a goal. And we can see that in the recruiting that's going on of Somalis today, whether it's here in other parts of the country. Something that has made it even more difficult to track is the social media, the internet, Facebook. I mean, this is different from the 9-11 generation. In 9-11, people were using the internet to put messages, but they were not using it as the sophisticated recruitment device that it is today. And you'll see in the literature that they talk about jihadis in the basement that you don't even need to go to a training camp. You don't even need to be part of a group. You can find fellow travelers there on the internet. And some of these kids may be telling mom and dad they're doing their homework. They're doing math and science when they're downloading videos. They're getting manuals. And this makes it very difficult to ferret out, especially in a society that values its liberties. We don't want to be snooping, but we don't want people building bombs or concocting plots. The New York Times at various times has said that the counterterrorism investigation that goes on here in the Twin Cities is the most significant counterterrorism investigation since 9-11. That's disturbing probably to most citizens. It gives me an opportunity, having worked in this area, to talk about these issues, to talk about issues that matter to you right here. We know or I'll remind you that the first American suicide bomber, a man by the name of Shurwat Ahmed, was from the Twin Cities. He was recruited here, and he went back to Somalia, fighting against what he considered oppressors, but fighting for what the State Department considered a designated terrorist group. He blew himself up, 2008. And you don't have to be the head of the CIA or the head of the FBI to figure out that that's a problem that if somebody is willing to blow himself up overseas, it won't take much to turn that person back to the United States. Now ISIS, or ISIL, is in the news. We're concerned about the situation in Syria and Iraq, and we find out that that recruitment pipeline that involved 20 or so people here seems to have expanded. That we have people not only going to Somalia to train with al-Shabaab, but we have people that are going to Syria and Iraq to fight against our interests. So this is, I mean, this is a concern. And for this visual, I'd like you to imagine 
a tale of two cities, but it's not the cities from Dickens, but it's the cities that are important to this community. Mogadishu in Somalia and Little Mogadishu here today. And to keep in mind what's going on in those two communities because they do have an interplay. Let me present you an alarming scenario. And it plays into my idea of what we do after the next attack. I have bad news. While you've been here, three men and one woman have been recruited in the Twin Cities and they are engaged in a terrorist attack. They trained in Somalia at Al-Shabaab camp and they are now at the Mall of America. They watched what happened in Mumbai at a series of hotels and they've carried out this plan at this moment. And they're shooting people in the Mall of America. They're detonating bombs and there's a lot of blood there. Explosives and this has happened. This is, this is the reality that we're going to face when we leave this this fine setting. And I want you to ask, well, what, what are we going to do? What should we do? And that will be the test for all of us. And it's a simple test between our brain, or in our brain, a battle between the front part of your brain, the cortex, and the back of your brain, the reptilian side. Because you will be angry and you'll want to stop other people from doing this. But I'm not sure that that's the right approach. Now, if we, I've been asking you to close your eyes and have these visuals. It would be easy for me to say visualize a brain scan. I don't want you to do that. I want you to visualize the American Eagle. If you notice, the CIA seal incorporates the Eagle. My National Security Forum, we have an Eagle there. And what I like about this symbol is that it represents two ideas that are not always in balance but need to be. One is to protect ourselves against the exterior threats, to defend. But at the same time that you're doing this to protect your liberties, because the eagle stands for defense and liberty at the same time. So that's a nice image for you to have in your minds. Think of that great American eagle doing both of those functions. So how about a few comments about Islam? Let's not dodge from this topic. What's the Muslim world? If you do a Wikipedia, you'll see about 1.6 1, 1 billion people. Some are devout, some are less devout, some are Shiites, some are Sudanese. And within this community, the number of people that are hardcore Sunni extremists is very small. And you're probably not going to change their mind. If you were able to meet Ayman Zawahiri, the head of Al-Qaeda, as charming as you are, as much Minnesota nice as you do, you will not talk him out of it. Don't, don't even try. And then he has, in Al-Qaeda, a few hundred people that are with him. And you probably can't talk them out of it. But it's that next circle, the people that might drive for them, the people that will give $100. Those are people whose minds can be changed. And you might not necessarily change them by going at them and pointing fingers, or, fingers at them and telling them that they're a threat. And then there's that third circle, which will be all the Muslims in the world. And if they feel that you're attacking that second circle, or people that are like them, they will feel threatened. And they may be radicalized, or they may not help you. So the visual that I want you here to imagine is three circles. Now, three circles. There's a bullseye that's small. There's a second circle, these help us. And then there's a lot of space in the third circle. And we as a country are fighting for the people in that second circle. Bring them to the peaceful side. Get them to help us. Even if they won't help, get them to not be willing to help extremists. And that's a daily task for all of us. Now I can see there's, this gentleman here is saying, you know, Professor, that's all very nice, but would you be practical? You know, give us some ideas of what we can do right now that we've had the attack. What recommendations do you have? And I'll give you a few recommendations. One is, one is to work on this idea of assimilation, whether it's coaching soccer, educational programs, reaching out so that people, whether Somalis, Iranians, whatever nationality, so that they do not feel that they're on the margin. Get people like that to come to these kind of events. Reach out to them. I mean, this is one of our main lines of defense. And, and the experts will tell you, if somebody spends a lot of time here, it's difficult for many of them to maintain that hatred. Because we're, we're generally good people. Now, what was surprising about Mohammed Atta one of the 9-11 hijackers is that he spent 
a couple years here and maintain that hatred. And as I said, with that inner core, there's only so much you can do. I would increase the amount of electronic surveillance we're doing. This is not going to be well received, but I think the debates about NSA and Snowden, I think they're somewhat off mark. Is after the next attack, you'll look at back at those de debates and say, this was off. We need to have more electronic surveillance. We need to be giving up some of our privacy to be able to ferret out some of these plots. We need to be running more intelligence networks, whether it's here or overseas, human sources, developing relationships, whether it's the CIA overseas, whether it's the FBI here. And then, here's my professorial mode, educational programs. I think everyone should be required to take a course in anthropology and to look at where humans, where they started and where they spread. And if you really think that you're superior because you're a Swede over the Norwegians, you need to go back for another course. <laughs> and then discussions about Islam. And don't get high-minded, because a Muslim will then come back and tell you that if you only focus on the Crusades, the Inquisition, and what went on in Northern Ireland, your religion may seem violent to many people. There are negative aspects to Islam in practice. We can be aware of it, but we don't have to emphasize it and blow it out of proportion. So here's my seventh visual, and this is, this is a collage of faces of Muslims, the diversity of the Muslim world. And it's got the title under it, it says, I am a Muslim. I am a Muslim. You'll see Africans. You'll see blonde, blue-haired, blue-eyed people that look like you all. I am a Muslim. Get used to it. There are a lot of them. Now, this, the caveat, as I head to the home stretch, is that I don't have an answer to one scenario. And I think the president agrees with me about this. And we want to push this off. If we have a catastrophic attack, chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, I don't think that we are capable of a proper emotional response. I think it's over. It won't take the United States away physically, but I don't think that we will live our life the way we did before. It's too much to ask. That's a catastrophic attack. That's not the attack that we just had at the Mall of America, in my scenario. That's not 9-11. That's not even a dirty bomb. We, we can handle those kind of attacks. We have the resilience, as we showed in Boston. But if you have a bomb, a nuclear bomb, that goes off in an American city, that's the end. And I think most CIA directors most intelligence officials will admit it. It's a new, it will be a new era. And that visual, and it's a negative one, is something out of a Mad Max movie. Who's, who's seen that movie? Huh? Yeah. Mad Max, Mel Gibson, the early ones. It's post-apocalyptic. And there's a still from that. And keep your hands up, because I need these votes that say, I'm happy that Radson came here instead of that other speaker. <laughs> keep, keep them up. Let, let me give you some more bad news before you say to yourselves, we can rise to this challenge that Professor Radson has given us today. Our track record is mixed in terms of dealing with crises. The Palmer Raids. Have you heard of the Palmer Raids? It's when we went after communists in the 20s. We saw reds everywhere. Red was the color in everybody's eyes. It, it's as if our retinas had changed. Korematsu, does this ring a bell? In turning 120,000 Japanese Americans and Japanese aliens in camps on trumped up charges of espionage, sabotage, there wasn't anything to it. Landowners in California, they wanted to take the land of Japanese farmers, this was convenient. World War II, not such a great reaction. And those of you that keep score, Republicans and Democrats, remember, Korematsu, that was FDR, that's on a Democrat's watch. The hostage crisis. 1979 to 81, scapegoating that went on here. We saw Iranians everywhere. They even considered me a threat, American-born. My uncle was on a kill list, but that reptilian brain said, he looks like them. He smells like them. He eats the same food that they do. I don't know that I trust him. And I'm hoping that the cortex will take over. So this is you know, this is the negative image. Maybe some of you that haven't been pleased with the presentation will enjoy this, but the image is me in a detention camp. That after all my service, if something goes boom, 
you won't even be comfortable with me. You won't feel safe with this American-born person that's been trying to help his country. And if our Somali friends think that I'm picking on them, I want to remind them. I'm a child of immigrants. My parents are both, both Muslims. They're from Iran. I think Iran conjures up as many negative images as Somalia, and we ask people, deal with it. Embrace us. We're not all terrorists. So what, we, what can we do? I don't want us to end on a sour note, and I think Tim is happy we're, we're staying within time. And how many times have you heard that a professor would speak 25 to 30 and he stayed within his time limit? This is an accomplishment in itself. So I want you now, those of you that have been playing with these visuals, I want you to open your eyes, open them wide. I want you to smile. As things go on, I want you to hug your neighbor. I want you to rejoice. Remember, you survived one of the worst winters in Minnesota history. <laughs> you survived another year in what the New York Times, as early as the 19th century, described as American Siberia. You made it. You're up to the challenge. You can handle another attack. You can do it. We trust you. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And may the peace of Allah and God be upon us all today as we handle these important issues. I believe that's the first time a town hall forum audience has been asked to hug one another, but restrain yourselves, Minnesotans. I know you want to do it, but <laughs> thank, thank you, John Rosden. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson, the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker is Afshin John Rodson, a leading authority on national security and professor at William Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church for our next forum on Thursday, October 16 at noon, when distinguished journalist Bob Herbert will speak on the topic, Losing Our Way, Can We Restore the American Dream? Our events are always free and open to the public, and further information can be found at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, John Rosden, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. I'd like to return first to the three circles you mentioned. Uh, you said the inner circle radicalized extremists who, who really uh, we couldn't affect or change, a few hundred of those. The second circle, I believe you said to me before the program, a couple hundred thousand maybe, several hundred thousand? I, I wouldn't even go that high. That, not I, even I, that high, okay. Let's, let's say in the tens of thousands. But okay, it's very tens of thousands. And the third circle, of course, the rest of Islam, a billion point five, uh, 1.5 plus Muslims. How are our policies affecting the size and the direction those circles go? Uh, what we're doing, for instance, right now in Syria and Iran, uh, what's your sense of whether that's driving people from the second circle into the inner circle or out toward the, the vast uh, majority of Muslims. If we focus on I Iraq and Syria, this is a delicate play for the president and all his advisors. We know that we have a threat there. This threat may eventually reach us in the United States. It's destabilizing the region. It would take discipline. It would take courage not to do anything about the situation. What's clear to the advisors is that by going into this area and bombing or rounding people up, using force, this is going to be played or distorted on, in the various media outlets, and we're probably going to create people that do not like what we're doing. So it's going to have that boomerang effect, and, and that's the balance of the, the long-term strategy versus the immediate strategy. You'll hear somebody like uh, David Petraeus talk in these terms about the counterinsurgency aspect, which is the long, the long game for this. And I, I focus my remarks on this counterinsurgency. But if you have an, an immediate threat, you have to deal with the terrorism, the counterterrorism. 
the, the short-term threat, and sometimes those are in sync, sometimes they're not. Does religious extremism really have anything to do with religion? It, it, it may. I, I, I think in this society, people that are devout perhaps are in the minority. People that take their faith seriously for one of the first times in history are in a small group. And they will seem to atheists, to agnostics, they will seem extreme that they carry these views. Now, even within these traditions, you're, you're going to have a range of practices, some of which correspond with our society that is a blend of religious and non-religious, and some that will seem, some that will seem extreme. But I think the, uh, the tipping point for most is when you decide that you're going to kill other people because of their religion, their thoughts, or their group identification. This is something that those three great religions should come together and say, this is, this is wrong. You don't, you don't pick out Shiites if you're a Sunni extremist to kill. You don't pick out Christians. You don't pick out Jews. And with this type of extremism that we focused on, they have attacked all of these groups. And, and part of our long game is trying to remind the Muslim world that Muslims have probably been a higher proportion of the victims of Sunni extremist attacks, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's I ISIS, or whether it's Al-Shabaab. The original Town Hall Forum program for this evening featured a speaker who uh, is a no well-known atheist, uh, and he felt he had to withdraw because of the many threats against him uh, in, in coming to the Twin Cities, threats from religious extremists. How can we assess whether those threats were real or not? What's your reaction? What's your feeling about that? I don't want to d diminish uh, any of the explanations that you've heard. If he has voicemails, if he's had letters, emails that are of a threatening sort, and he's decided that he doesn't want to speak here because of that, we'll, we'll have to accept that, that he has that kind of information. On the other hand, if he's reading the New York Times about our community and deciding that this is a hotbed for radical acts, I think that that is an extreme reaction in itself, that people are safe here. I, I feel safe. The Somali community feels safe. They've had some people that have decided to go and train in camps. They've been recruited for groups. But as I said to uh, a family member that I love uh, more than anything in this world, I think that there was more of a threat in our drive from St. Paul to here today than there was from any terrorist attack for me or anyone else here. And some of you were driving with me, and if you had that text at the same time that you were reaching around, please don't do it. You're going to hurt yourself and maybe hurt somebody else. In your remarks, you mentioned Little Mogadishu, a neighborhood here in, in Minneapolis. How do, how do we as a community open some dialogue across barriers that are cultural and, and uh, ethnic and, and immigrant and, and non-immigrant, um, uh, conversations that we presently are not having in the community between perhaps the, the community of Little Mogadishu and the rest of this city on these very issues? It, it, it's difficult because you don't want to in, invade people's sense of their space, what is familiar to them. But I think you want to, you want to meet people on, on their area, where they, where they like to eat, where they go and smoke cigarettes, where they have tea. If you know a Somali, ask, ask to be taken to that place. It's also a great opportunity for interfaith dialogue because many of our Somalis are devout. They revere their religion, but they understand that Christianity is also a religion of the book. And if somebody, if you reach out to them and say, you want to talk about areas where you have things in common, or common, common difficulties that you have for people of faith, whether they're Christians, whether they're Jews or Muslims, I, I think most people would be receptive. And I think a lot of the religious leaders in town have have been willing to have these kind of exchanges, and we need to do more. And not, not only church to church, find, find out what they like to do, whether they like to play soccer or other sports. I mean, we, we were relieved. I was playing uh, soccer with my son in St. Paul, and there was an area that was fairly clear that they were playing uh, soccer among themselves. It was a Somali group, and we thought, well, maybe we won't be accepted into this group, and they were far more welcoming than people playing sports on other playgrounds. And we got over whatever inhibitions we had, and there was no reason to have these inhibitions. It's, it's reaching out. And I, 
Again, disagree with Tim. If you feel like hugging your neighbor, go ahead and do it. It'll, it'll be okay. And, and if anyone feels like hugging me, you come on up here. I'll, I'll give you a big hug. Yeah, uh, you've got a long wait before that'll happen. <laughs> This question has to do with your background in national security and uh, as a person who formerly worked with the CIA. Do you believe that uh, today in 2014 the FBI and CIA and other U.S. agencies are sharing security information more effectively than they were in the years, months, and weeks, and days before 9-11? The record was so bad before 9-11. They don't have to do much more to say that they're doing better. And I, I ask my friends in the FBI, and you know the FBI, they're much more willing to talk about their work than the former CIA or the current CIA. And I only had a few years of the CIA, I had six years of the Justice Department. And I ask them this question, and they all tell me that we're, we're doing better. We're doing much better, but I sense in their body language that maybe we're not doing as well as we should. They're, they're different organizations, the FBI and the CIA. They have different cultures. They have different missions. There, there are going to be some problems in communication for those groups. You remember in 2009, the attempted Christmas Day bombing. Abdul Mutalab, the underwear bomber, the, he tried to detonate explosives in his underwear, and President Obama was appalled because we had set up these memoranda, better cooperation among the agencies. We had set up the National Counterterrorism Center with this idea that you would take the bits and pieces of intelligence and put it together. We had the bits and pieces there, but we didn't put it together. But, but keep in mind, as, as they say, they have to be 100% effective all the time for you to be happy. You know, all it takes is one slip up, and there's a, there's a loss of life, and there's a damage to our American fabric. So that's a high order. But I, I'm hopeful. I think, I think they're doing better than they did. I think we had an opportunity in the first few years after 9-11, before we made the pivot into Iraq. We were doing far better in Afghanistan than people imagine. We were winning the counterterrorism mission. To borrow from what President Obama said, Al-Qaeda was there in Afghanistan. Saddam Hussein was a secular leader. He didn't have any links with Al-Qaeda. If he did, they were marginal. And then we made this pivot for other reasons a country that was boxed in by no-fly zones. We should have finished the counterinsurgency job in Afghanistan, and then there would have been the possibility to address other, other problems in other parts of the world. But we have to play the hand that we have today, and it's a very disturbing situation in Syria and Iraq. That you might look back to the Al-Qaeda problem and say that was easier to handle. Going into Afghanistan, once we had American will, I don't see that there's an easy solution to what's going on in Syria and Iraq. What do you see as the long-range future of ISIS or ISIL? The, I'm not a politician, so I can tell you I have no idea. And I think the president has no idea. And they say that they're going to decimate them, get rid of them. That's the posturing that must come from politicians. But they're hoping that they can reduce the threat from ISIS back here and reduce the destabilizing influence that it has in the region. Now, this problem creates strange alliances. Remember, ISIS is a Sunni extremist group. The Syrian group is fighting against Assad. Assad is propped up by the Iranians, but we don't like the Syrians or the Iranians, but they would be two very important partners in fighting ISIS. And we keep courting Iran, asking them, let's do something, and Iran wants the sanctions taken away. And we missed an opportunity for cooperation. I think earlier on with Iran, and they're, they're playing the long game in the region. And I, I wonder from their perspective, are they sincerely concerned about ISIS coming to them? Is it a threat, or do they view it as something that will weaken our position in the Middle East? And they're probably sophisticated Iranian officials that have each of those two views, and they're debating that. Do they consider ISIS to be their problem? A, a real problem. If so, then there are areas of cooperation with us. Or is this a way to bleed us in the Middle East? In that case, they're not going to help us. Until only a few months ago, really, most of us had never heard of ISIS. Uh, will there continue to be new extremist separatist groups, uh, splinter groups forming, if ISIS is, in fact, defeated or degraded? Sure, this is 
what the terrorism experts describe as a metastasizing, is that you, you go after one group, it splinters, you get more radical groups. There are people that are talking to reporters at the New York Times and other places saying that there, there are groups even worse than ISIS and ISIL. There are groups that are more radical, and once you eliminate ISIS or ISIL, or once you lower the threat, then some of these groups will emerge. I mean, this, this is what President Bush said, this is what President Obama said, that this fight against extremism, against terrorism, is a generational fight. Now, generations are 20 to 30 years, and I think both of them mean it. Now, we went a, a number of years without any problems here in the United States. We, we thought that there would be more attacks, major attacks in the United States we've gotten 13 years. That's not that long in the perspective of some of these terrorist groups. It's obvious to you, but let's repeat it. The first attack on the World Trade Center was 1993. They killed some people, they took a part of the building, they kept coming and they waited eight years. And in that nasty and hateful way, they finished the job. So even if we've gone eight years, 10 years without an attack, it's not done. Now the interesting question I'll turn is how do we know that we've won the war on terror? How would you set up the metrics for that? How many years do you have to go without an attack? And some of you may be suspicious. I mean, this props up a lot of spending by our national security machinery. And ask it from the perspective of a president. I mean, when can you tell the people, relax? It's not as bad as I said. And then if you have an attack, how the people will come after you. And keep in mind that this president's name is Barack Hossein Obama. And I think he's worried about your reptilian response if something happens and you haven't protected the American homeland. So he's going to err on the side of protecting rather than have, he's not so concerned about you worried about your civil liberties. He wants to make sure that something big doesn't go boom in an American city. And, and it's a huge responsibility. If we increase electronic surveillance, as you recommend, won't we, won't we be giving in to terrorism by giving up our individual liberties that we seek to defend? Yes, in, in part we will, but I think it's a, it's a sacrifice that's worth making. Because if we have that next attack, I, I think people will then put on the table far more aggressive measures. I'm trying to put off that catastrophic attack. I'm, trying to figure out if we have a series of attacks in the next 10, 20 years, what is the reasonable long-term framework for battling terrorism? You know, some, something that doesn't swing back and forth. And I'm, I, don't, I don't spend much time, if any, on Facebook or these areas. I assume that somebody's listening to my phone conversations. I try to be more eloquent. I work on it. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not tough with, you remember the prior president, he had a problem with Subject, verb, predicate. <laughs> so I am happy to be here. I mean, that's a sentence. And I'm doing better than one president of the United States. How do you assess the actions of former NSA employee Edward Snowden, who released information on this electronic surveillance done by the government? Was this an act of treason or the act of a whistleblower? I was asked this question once before on Minnesota Public Radio, so for those of you that go on the archives, I'm going to give the same answer. The answer is both, and it depends on point of view or emphasis. From the standpoint of the American intelligence community, you can't have people deciding that they can share top secret information with the Russians or other groups. You'll break down any military organization, any intelligence organization. So this is an act of treason, an act of espionage. It's a crime that needs to be prosecuted. On the other hand, from the standpoint of citizens, we feel that there's too much secrecy. We don't know enough about our government. I think many of us appreciate information so we can have a more robust debate on this proper balance of electronic surveillance within a democracy. Now, I keep talking about balance. There's another one of these balances that is very, very difficult. You have democracy, which requires openness, transparency, but then you have agencies that need secrecy to be effective. The CIA, the military, the State Department. You can't tell people in Syria where we're going to bomb in advance. It will break down. Now, how do you balance this? What is the right level of secrecy and transparency? That's very much in the eye of the beholder. And it sometimes depends on 
whether your guy or gal is in the Oval Office. And what I'm suggesting is let's think about a proper balance that will span a generation, Democrats, Republicans. I, I'm willing to accept a little bit more electronic surveillance, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. Let's have the debate. And I think the, the president is not sure. He's been calling for this debate with the American people to find, you know, to find the right equilibrium point. What's your position on aggressive interrogation or torture with suspected terrorists as a means to national security? Remember, this was the big issue after 9-11. We did not interrogate that many people. We're now killing rather than capturing and interrogating people by the use of drones. I, I think the debate's been simplified, and I'd like to, again, create the third category. The question is not to torture or not to torture. There's one threshold of what we can do if we approach this problem from the law enforcement standpoint. The FBI's rules, due process, that gets you about this far. Then there's a gap, and in that area you have some tactics that go beyond what the FBI can use, but are below any reasonable definition of torture. I'm not talking about waterboarding. I'll give, for example, the idea of sleep deprivation. A day of keeping somebody up, two days. Now, the definition of torture is severe physical or psychological pain. I think you cheapen the word torture by saying a day of sleep deprivation is torture. So if you had Ayman Zawahiri in custody, the head of Al-Qaeda, and he's not giving you information, and you're worried about active plots, I, as the president, or I, as his advisor, would be tempted to go beyond the FBI model. And the president retains that discretion right now. He said, we will not torture, but that's not as a matter of American law. That's an executive order. And he has this gray area that is permitted to him for these interrogations. And the question I have for you all is, is Obama charming enough or duplicitous enough to say, we don't torture? We have this executive order. And he signed a secret amendment to that executive order, allowing some of these enhanced interrogations. That's a problem for democracy, but I think that the secrecy that goes with presidential power permits this. And when you pick a president, you're picking the possibility that someone would do that, in addition to the possibility of taking us to war. Can you say something about the psychological profile of people that uh, are being drawn into the radical Islamist groups from, say, Europe or the United States? What are the, the reasons young men or women from the Somali neighborhood in Minneapolis might be drawn into uh, joining a, a militant group overseas? There's a whole host of reasons, and I don't claim to have in any p particular profile or trait. I don't think it exists within the law enforcement community. I don't think it exists in the intelligence community. And this is public record. For a while, we were trying to figure out what causes people to become traitors, if we're recruiting spies or are people becoming uh, spies for the other side. And you find out that there's a whole range of reasons of why people are unhappy, why they would do something that's a crime, or why they would go on this conveyor belt. But Tim, on this on one point where the experts agree is we used to believe we had this narrative about Muslims in Europe and Muslims in the United States. And for a long time, we thought that we had the happy Muslims. People, Muslims that come to America, they're happy. They, they're not going to do anything wrong. And the Muslims that they have in England and France, those are the unhappy Muslims. They do bad things in those countries, and they get recruited. That narrative has broken down. Because if you go back on basic immigration patterns, these Muslims started in many of the same countries. Whether they had the family network or an opportunity, some of them go to Europe, some of them go here. Through the social media, we find out that there are a lot more connections now between European Muslims and American Muslims in this, this broader radicalization process. It, it's, it's a problem. It's been a problem for them. It is a problem for us. To what degree to do uh, uh, policies that try to force assimilation, for instance, uh, laws against wearing a burqa in public, to what degree are those contributing to the problem, radicalization? I, we, don't, we don't force that upon people here. We may have our social pressures, but I think your, your question or your questioner is getting into some of the practices in France. I mean, France is very adamant about protecting their secular values, insisting that women take off the burqas or other headdress as a part of their 
their values there. And I, I followed some of the reading. I'm not an expert there, but it seems that this is then uh, bothering, alienating some of the Muslims there, and it's definitely being discussed in capitals in the Muslim world. They point to France and say to their people or others, look, this is how they treat Muslims. They don't respect your religion. And it has a possibility in terms of radicalizing. The last time we had a town hall forum speaker who told us that he was threatened coming to speak here was Morris Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And his work uh, is focused on um, going after US domestic-based terrorists, mostly Christian extremists on the right, and apparently there are several such groups in Minnesota, and he was threatened, but he came anyway and spoke. Uh, we haven't talked about domestic terrorists, uh, non-Islamist terrorists, Tim Timothy McVeigh comes to mind. To what degree is that an actual threat today in our, in our culture, in our society, do you think? It's, we, we have that potential in other groups, and, and the McVeigh will then be the non-religious non type of terrorist. My sense is that relative to the threat that comes from Muslim-inspired groups, that that, that is receded, but we, we may be letting down our guard. And I want to make one, one comment. You heard some Arabic words. That's the invocation from the Quran. I'm not a religious Muslim. It's the invocation to every chapter. But I noticed some people were very troubled to hear Arabic words in a church, and it means most compassionate, most municipal God. I mean, we all believe in the same God. They, they're fulfilling your mission. So just because it was spoken in Arabic doesn't mean anything naughty was said. Salaham, salam alaikum, right? Peace be upon you. Peace be upon you sounds nicer, but it's all right if it's said in a different language. That's control, not... control those reactions. <laughs> I should point out that's not the first time Arabic has been spoken in the sanctuary. Uh, we've been called to worship by uh, Arabic um, um, muevins from a local mosque. But I know why the woman disapproved, because I'm a Persian speaking Arabic with a Persian accent. Ah. She said his, Arab, his Arabic is so bad, and I think she wants to come up here and do that invocation when we finish. And I, I again embrace her, and I won't hug her. <laughs> Somebody's got to give this man a hug when this program's <laughs> over, all right? Tim, that's coming from you. <laughs> let, let, me, let me ask you about uh, uh, Minneapolis City Council. Uh, Abdi Warsami, elected as a Somali-American from Little Mogadishu, uh, and now on our city council. Is that going to affect in a positive way the kind of assimilation you're talking about in our community? How can it not? We believe in democracy elections. We're telling people, if you want to push your values, run for office, vote for people that you accept in office, how could it not? And, and I, I believe that the election of Obama was a great victory against some of the recruitment. Because of his immigrant background, because of a grandfather that was a Muslim, what a great symbol for the United States that goes beyond politics. I mean, the first election I watched some of the news, I speak Spanish and French, and I watched the news programs there on the internet. And they were asking among themselves. They didn't know that there was an American listening in. They said, could this happen here? Could we have somebody with Obama's background to rise to the highest position in our democracy? And the answer in the UK was no. The answer in France was no. And the consensus was that they were a generation away. So I've given you some gloomy scenarios, but that is good news. That goes beyond his politics that it is something great for this country that you can elect somebody whose father came from Africa, right, who has a crazy name. I think it's one of the comedians that said, this is the greatest politician, right? Barack, it reminds you of Iraq. Hossein, it's going to remind you about Saddam Hussein. Then Obama, you confuse with Osama. And that's, <laughs> and that guy gets elected two times. That's, that's great. <laughs> I, I'm glad we're ending on an upbeat note because it was a little bit uh, rough earlier. Uh, let, let me just ask you this. Knowing what you know, and you know a lot more than the people in this room about religious extremism, are you, are you hopeful for American democracy and, and our future in this land? Yes. We've had extreme views, political views, religious views, and it seems to work in this country. I talked to a religious Iranian who's a a former advisor to one of the presidents. We were walking down the beach in Venice, in California, and you have all kinds there. And he had a big smile on his face. 
And I said, what's going on? He said, your country is the most amazing large intestine that I have ever seen. <laughs> and you, I, you know what he meant, but I said, what do you mean? He said, you can take anything and you digest it and you seem to get nutrition from it. That is great. That's something to be proud of. Yeah. You, you began by saying you were going to offer us some really good visual imagery. <laughs> and and you, end, you ended on a notable image. Thank you very much. Thank you, John Rosdown. <laughs>